Dan Lawson. I'm currently the director of the Center for Civil Rights Remedies at UCLA Civil Rights Project. Um, I've been at the Civil Rights Project since 1999, uh, since graduating from law school, uh, where I was, uh, I went to Georgetown, combination of Georgetown and Harvard. And so um, I went into law school after being a teacher for 10 years. And I knew um, when I was a teacher, I went into teacher, into teaching as a form of thinking it was going to be a form of social activism. And it was to less degree than I had anticipated. And so when I went to law school, I did so intentionally to work on uh, racial justice in the context of education. Um, there weren't a lot of education law courses, but I was able to sort of cobble together uh, enough, as well as I did a federal legislation clinic with Achai uh, Feldblum at Georgetown before I came to Harvard, and that was really helpful. And then when I was at Harvard, I worked with uh, Martha Minow before she became the dean, and one of her areas of expertise is education law and policy and civil rights. So I was able to teach uh, after graduating. Well, when I was there, I helped with her course and then I was able to teach it um, for, I only taught, uh, taught at one time, but I was able to do some teaching as well as have clinical students when the Civil Rights Project was part of Harvard Law School. And from the very beginning, one of the first issues I worked on was looking at the confluence of all the issues that we worked on at the Civil Rights Project and how this uh, contributed to mass incarceration of especially people of color, but especially black students um, or black as adults. <clears throat> um, and so we thought, well, let's put the pieces together. So I was working on things like school discipline and graduation rates and resource inequity and in fact, at the urging of uh, Charles Ogletree, I uh, did a school to prison pipeline um, amicus brief in a school finance case, um, uh, the Hancock legislation, as it uh, was known at the time. And uh, it was unsuccessful, but uh, it, it made me realize that it's really important to put these pieces together. So when we, we, um, also sponsored a research conference with North, Northeastern with uh, Debbie Ramirez, um, I believe it was. Uh, and it was on the school to prison pipeline, bringing together lawyers and researchers to look at how um, we could better uh, create research and then use that research to address this problem. And we called it the school to prison pipeline only because my expertise and our expertise was in education and civil rights. So we weren't look, the only reason we weren't looking at everything from healthcare to housing to unemployment issues and how racism affects those both explicit racism and implicit bias and structural racism. The only reason we didn't do the cradle of prison was our expertise and our sort of area of that we were trying to affect change in was in the educa public education system. So um, it was not as a sort of intentional, oh, these other things don't matter, um, but it was more like, where can we have an impact? So uh, we had this research conference with in, in that we convened together with Northeastern to um, bring advocates and researchers and policymakers together and then we brought some of those findings to the work we did on federal legislation, as well as work supporting uh, states, as well as individual advocacy efforts. So that's sort of a very brief summary, but that should give you an idea. That's great. Thank you. Um, it always sounds like uh, a lot of what you mentioned focuses on education and civil rights, uh, I'm wondering when in your experience with keeping that in mind, what's, what is the story of the cradle to prison pipeline? Um, so in, in other words, to you, what, what does it mean? What does that phrase mean, cradle to prison pipeline? I know you talked a little bit about the school to prison pipeline. Um, what is, 
yeah, the cradle of the president pipeline is all the ways that various forms of racism um, lead to what at the end of the day is the mass incarceration, especially of people of color and especially of black people in this country. So the cradle looks at all the aspects of um, inequality or, an in, or better term is actually inequity um, and including all the ways, it's not just racism, but all the ways that racism affects that and thinks about all the different ways to, to look at that. So if you're looking at discrimination in healthcare, employment, housing, and all those. So when we call it, when we use the term the school of prison pipeline versus the cradle of prison pipeline, we're leaving out all the things that happen to kids when they're young, but also things that are happening to their families um, that contribute to this sort of uh, very um, disturbing pathway that is um, unfortunately emblematic of the America that we have not just today, but it reflects the legacy of, of, of sort of a racist structure. And um, I know we spoke also, you, you already started talking about the role of education and how there's, a, there's this disproportionate impact on, on children of color. Um, I'm wondering if you, if, if you could talk a little bit about sort of any research efforts into that. Um, what does the current state of legislative efforts um, circulating around education, where does that stand now? I know that with COVID-19, um, there have been a lot of efforts sort of like pushing police out of school um, and really rethinking about the way that uh, the school system sort of impacts children of color in various ways. Yeah, so the, we're engaged in research um, all the time, but also in bringing that research, those research findings, the attention of lawyers if they're litigating, policymakers if they're either board members or legislators, um, as well as to grassroots community groups to help uh, bolster their efforts. And you know those are the ones that um, really make the most difference. Because even when you win a, a victory and get something in a law or you win a lawsuit, these are not self-implementing. We're really talking about upending these long-term patterns and structures, <clears throat> things like implicit as well as explicit racial bias. And that really takes a community effort to be successful. Um, so some of the research areas, for example, um, Paul Martinez, a research associate that is a co-author in our uh, California report and our upcoming national study, he did analysis of the um, connections between having security guards and uh, their security guard to student ratios uh, and the rates of lost instruction due to suspensions. So we used the data from the civil rights data collection to look at every district in the country, but we focused uh, for our most recent report because it was about California on the California high schools. And he found that, um, and this is now published uh, that there is a, a positive relationship between having a higher security guard to student ratio and having a higher rate of days of loss instruction <clears throat> due to uh, suspensions. We also found that this was a stronger relationship when we just looked at black students and also that the inverse was true. So when we looked at the ratio of support staff, student support staff, that's uh, nurses, psychologists, counselors, and social workers, uh, to students, when that was higher, uh, the rates of lost instruction for black students in high schools was lower. So those things go together. And so hopefully that will help inform decisions that school boards are making throughout California. Now, uh, we sent our findings to the board members in both Oakland and uh, Los Angeles, as well as to the superintendent of schools. Um, and hope the other thing we discovered, you know, we look at ways, subtle ways sometimes that systems can, uh, that are supposed to be corrective can actually 
be ineffective. So one of the achievements of advocates in California was to have school uh, suspension rates as part of their accountability system. So any district there that has a suspension rate of over 6% of the students enrolled, they're flagged for getting technical assistance. So uh, this is identified as a problem that they have to address. Now they don't apply that same 6% rule to every racial subgroup. And they also give credit if there's an improvement even of less than one percentage point. And we did an analysis of all the school districts in California and found that many of the high suspending ones, ones that had been increasing their suspension rates despite a statewide downward trend, they had gotten instead of flagged as red for their high rates, they got flagged with a, a sort of a less alarming color like yellow or, or, or orange, which signifies maybe there's a problem, but that there's no immediate technical assistance needed. Even though they had, you know, the year before may, may have increased their suspension rates many percentage points and were well over the 6% threshold. But because in the most recent year, they made an improvement of a fraction of one percentage point they weren't coded red. And there's a problem with that sort of focus on the immediate and ignoring the long-term trends. Um, so, and we point out in our report that a district could be steadily getting worse, making, you know, in terms of negative progress, it could be taking five steps backwards and then one baby step forwards and another five step backwards and a baby step forwards. And every other year it would look like there's not a serious problem. So that's not a very effective accountability system um, to, to get, they were giving too much credit for minimal progress and not enough attention on also the subgroups. That's another thing we pointed out in our report by studying some of the worst districts, we found that they might've made that, you know, slight improvement because the suspension rates for white students went down. Whereas the highest suspended group which was oftentimes black students, but not always, sometimes it was Latinx or others, um, got worse. But they ignored the fact that the group that was getting suspended at a much higher rate and a very high rate got worse. That was not part of the accountability system. So there's something missing when that's, uh, you know, you're allowed to look good, even though there's a real injustice going on as indicated by excessive rates of uh, suspensions. So that, those are two areas. And then nationally, another area that often doesn't get much attention is what's going on in alternative schools. And it turns out that alternative schools, these are schools that are meant to serve special needs kids, kids with behavioral problems granted, or kids who have, uh, kids who've been incarcerated, kids who are at risk of dropping out for various reasons, kids might go to an alternative school. Um, but these kids have suspension rates that are two, three, four times the national averages. We looked at all the alternative schools across the nation and found huge amounts of lost instruction. The other thing that's important is that we're looking at rates of lost instruction, um, not a, in a sort of benign way, but to really drive the point home that this is about deprivation of educational opportunity, to drive that point home in a way that educators can't help but hear it. So when you just talk about, you know, the risk for suspension or suspensions per 100, it's already one step removed from what's really going on, which is that kids' instruction, their opportunity to learn is being denied. And so to emphasize that point, um, we have, in the California report, we estimated the days of lost instruction, but in several other reports, including the next national report, we, um, at, we through advocacy efforts, we encouraged the Office for Civil Rights to collect the data. So it's the first time the data have been available. And now we're exposing what's going on in terms of the impact of out-of-school suspensions on days of lost instruction. We also have a whole section on school policing, and we've documented that in 80% of the large districts across the nation reported zero school-based arrests. And this is not because they're not arresting kids for school-based behavior. It's because they're 
despite a federal requirement, they're not reporting their data um, to the Office for Civil Rights. And there was also, uh, because of the work of advocates uh, at the national level, there was um, this requirement that these data are reported to the public every year was put into the Every Student Succeeds Act. So we were part of that effort. And now we're exposing the, we looked at every state website Every district in the nation should be reporting its school policing data to the public. But guess what? How many, how many states do you think are doing this? Take a wild guess, zero through 50, right? Probably not very many, I'd say less than 10. Zero. Yeah. <laughs> no. None. And that, the, that's outrageous because the law passed in 2016 and it takes, it wasn't being fully implemented right away, but we've, the data for the 2017-18 school year has been collected by the Office for Civil Rights and they're sitting on it. And this is information that we have a right to know. It's in a federal law that requires it explicitly in the statute. This is not a, a question of statutory interpretation. Yet not a single state is reporting, including California, but no state is reporting the, in their school, in their state and district report cards, things like referrals to law enforcement and school-based arrests. So those, that's the kind of work we do on the policy end. Again, in this specific area, we also found that a um, couple of states were saying that they were reporting the referrals to law enforcement. Now referrals to law enforcement are supposed to be every call to the police. The reason we're collecting those data and not just the school-based arrest data is because we're concerned that educators are calling cops on the children they're supposed to be educating. And that's a, that's a huge problem. Even if the cops don't arrest them, if there's a high volume of calls, like in Oakland, for example, according to the school police chief there, 2,000 calls were made to the police. Only 600 were warranted. So that means about 74% of all calls to the police by the educators were not warranted. So we need those sorts of data to really understand the impact of what's going on and it will help folks make the argument of why we should not have not just police on the campus, but it's a much broader problem. In fact, and another thing that you'll see in this national report that we're about to release is that a lot of the districts with the highest rates of school-based arrests don't have more than one police officer on the campus. So it's not always the case that there's a lot of police being employed by school districts. The real problem is with the educators, whether or not they have school-based police or using, you know, the local police. The problem is who is calling the cops on the kids? And it's predominantly kids of color and kids with disabilities. And kids with disabilities, this is another area of research that's really important um, that often gets sort of pushed to one side, but they are um, one of the most um, frequently, not just suspended, but also those are the kids that are, they're being, um, you know, called the police, people are calling the police on kids with disabilities. But those kids, oftentimes it is uh, something related to their disability or the school district's failure to meet their special education needs, that is the reason that they're misbehaving in the first place. Um, they're required to go to school, but if you don't provide them with the supports and services they need to be successful and they start acting up, that's, a, that's on the district. That's can't just blend in by law. That's a form of discrimination. It's called if your procedural protections are failing, and you don't have a behavioral, you haven't done a behavioral assessment or a behavioral improvement plan, um, and the student starts acting up in a way that you're saying, "Well, oh, this kid's," you know, the, and most of actually most of the offenses that they call police about are things like disrupting school assembly. So where we've had the data and looked at it more closely, we're finding it's not kids who are a danger to themselves or others. They're, those are included. That's but it's a small fraction. Most of the time when they're calling police, it's for minor misconduct. And the same thing with out-of-school suspensions. And most people don't realize that. Plus, there are huge racial disparities among the kids with disabilities. So there's two worlds. It's, there's the, you know, what happens to white kids with disabilities and what happens to everybody else. 
And white kids with disabilities, don't get me wrong, they are also um, victims of disability discrimination. But the racial divide is even larger when you look at the impact on instructional time for black kids with disabilities than any other group. Especially at, and another thing that we've done is break it down, not just look at elementary schools, because most elementary schools, regardless of race, are not getting suspended, they're not calling the cops on those kids. It's happening mostly in middle schools and high schools. So all of our reports now, well, our California report was unable to do this uh, for every district, but we did statewide. And our national report, every single district in the country, we break it down by elementary and secondary, because otherwise, what happens to elementary data, which are mostly zeros, make everything look like less of a problem when you include that. So when we take out the elementary schools and just focus on the secondary schools, it's shocking the amounts of, you know, there are, there are many districts where black kids, for example, and, black, and kids with disabilities are losing over a year of instructional time, over 182 days for every 100 kids enrolled. That's just incredible. That's off the charts. You know, it's usually, you know, it, around, I think the national average is at the secondary level is about 13 days. So 182, you can imagine, huge divide. And this is, again, speaking directly to a denial of an opportunity to learn along the lines of race and disability. We also break it down by gender. In some cases where we have the data, we look at the confluence of those things with low income and uh, English learners and that sort of thing. Thanks for <laughs> just for, for that, that whole very comprehensive rundown of the national scope of the issue. I know that um, here in, or in Massachusetts, um, there's some efforts to have a re requirements for schools to provide some sort of alternative instruction when students miss a certain number of days. Um, have you heard of how effective that is or do those type of initiatives um, combat the, the lost instruction in any way or are those just so poorly implemented or enforced that they yeah, I'm not, I, I explain that a little bit more. I'm I was speaking to um, Liza Hirsch and she sp spoke about how, um, you know, there are some requirements when a student misses a certain number of days. Um, I think it was, it was 10 um, or something like that, 10 cumulative days of instruction. Um, and if a student is suspended, then the school is required to provide either their assignments um, or or some form of tutoring in some way, um, but it was unclear how effective that is or whether that's even enforced. In so, so that's sort of, uh, it may have been that she was referring just to kids with disabilities or not, but could be part of chapter 222. I'm trying to remember the details. Um, but the problem is the 10 day, I call it the 10 day rule, is totally insufficient because most kids are suspended for two or three days at a pop. And oftentimes they'll fall short of 10 days, plus they don't count in school suspensions as denial of education for those purposes. Um, and that's unfortunate because that, then that's due really to an interpretation by the uh, Office of Special Education um, and Rehabilitative Services. It's a sort of a federal agency's interpretation of the law that I think is incorrect. I think in-school suspensions are, the, the ruling at, with kids with disabilities is anything that cumulatively or in one fell swoop adds up to more than 10 days is counted as a change of placement and you have to have a special meeting as well as make sure you can't deny a free, a free appropriate public education any more than those 10 days. So in a given school year, another part of the problem is once they figure out, most of the time, the, I've been, there are hearings for kids with disabilities, and if we have extended that to kids without disabilities, that's great, but in the hearing process, oftentimes, parents don't stand a chance, so the parents are trying to say, this is, this is due to behavior caused by the disability or because of the school district's failure to meet what's in the student's IEP, in which case, they can't even continue to suspend the kid, they have to keep them in the same placement. Um, so it's not just about the homework that they're missing, but it's about whether they can continue to suspend the kid for that kind of behavior. And so if it's a manifestation of the, of the student's own disability or 
a failure by the district to meet what the, the service to provide the services and supports they're supposed to provide, then the student shouldn't be suspended at all. Shouldn't be suspended really for one day if it's a manifestation of the student's disability. And I argue that the next year, the student exhibits the same behavior. They don't, they shouldn't start 10 day clock over again. They already know this information. So there's a 10 day rule as it's as applied to kids with disabilities, but basically, um, even if it's applied to kids without disabilities to some extent, most kids don't hit that 10 day threshold. But the problem with that thinking is that even missing one day is, can be devastating to a kid. Plus arrests, when kids are arrested or referred to the police, that's not counted either. That time is not logged under the tent unless they're suspended as well. So that there are times where kids are, you know, waiting to be adjudicated and they're out of school and it's unclear what's going on or if they're, it's just a sort of a gray area. <clears throat> um, the, other, the other problem is that the due process rights, um, unless you are well healed family, you're not gonna be able to really take advantage of those due process rights and hire a lawyer and someone who really knows how to work the system. So there's a, that's a form of structural racism in that we think we're providing protections for kids, but they really only flow to kids whose families know about their rights and can really use them or have some legal support through say free legal services. And I was one of those legal service providers in Massachusetts for a year. And I know that, you know, for every case I had, there were probably 10 kids out there that didn't have any representation. So there's, it's a huge problem. And I would say it's, it's um, you know, woefully insufficient. And we really need, um, you know, there's been discussion of making it a five day rule that might help a little, but you still have the problem where to avail yourself of these procedural protections, you really need a lawyer um, or to really know how to work the system as a, you know, so oftentimes it doesn't have to be someone with legal expertise. There are children's advocates who can also serve that function, but there are not enough of those to go around. And it's mostly kids of color and poor kids who are unjustly being removed. Um, not always, there are plenty of situations where, you know, they try the same kind of, uh, the same kind of problem evolves for for white kids and kids who are wealthier, but then they ha they can avail themselves of the protection. So it's a it's it's not really doing the work that it's intended to do. It's it's helpful to have some safeguard, um, but and a little bit of a foothold to push back on the system, but it's not it's not adequate. Great. Um... I think I'd like to shift gears a little bit, and I'm not sure how much you recall from the returning citizens videos, but if there's anything in particular that stood out to you that you'd like to comment on, I'd love to get your, your feedback on that. Yeah, I think one of the things is that it's sometimes hard for students to articulate this, um, but you, you know, you could see, and I forgot the names of the various uh, participants, but oftentimes, <clears throat> It was not just one systemic failure. It was oftentimes multiple ways, places where the, the student talked about the cradle to prison. You know, there should have been um, more support for the family or more support for the students that just didn't materialize. And from, you know, there are some instances where, um, you know, it was a blatant injustice, um, but others where it was a little more subtle. And um, that, that the, the impact of the sort of, the problems that are systemic in nature um, are not always uh, the easiest for the students to articulate, but there were places, uh, I don't remember exactly where, but where it did become pretty clear that this was, not just about this one student's story, but it was emblematic of a whole problem of sort of structural racism or a systemic sort of denial of rights. So it wasn't just happening to the student that was articulating the problem, but it seemed pretty clear that it was system, systemic. 
Thanks for that. Uh, I think the one other piece that I'd like to ask you about is, I know you described a lot of your work and you've talked a lot about the sort of the history of, of this problem. Um, and I wanted to get a sense for what your hopes are for, for the future, sort of. I know we talk a lot about what replaces the pipeline um, or, or about dismantling the pipeline, but I think it's also important to think about what replaces it. And I'm wondering if you have thoughts about how, how we replace the pipeline or what comes after the pipeline is dismantled. Yeah, so I, I think it's unfortunately a gradual process. So as you know, I'm old enough to know that you fight for major systemic changes. Um, and some of the things that, you know, when I first started working on, for example, school discipline issues and the failure to recognize that there was a problem where at the time, 50% of black and Latino males were dropping out of school and no one was even paying attention to it because they weren't calculating graduation rates. It wasn't part of our discussion even whether kids were graduating. So you have a K-12 system at the end of the day, whether kids get a diploma, that's the sort of the one outcome that should have mattered the most. They weren't even keeping track of that. So we've been able to be part of large movements to bring about those changes. And I guess one of the things that is heartening is to see um, greater a, a, a surging amount of community advocacy, as well as broader public support for those efforts. So Black Lives Matter, for example, is, you know, I experienced in Lexington, I was surprised to, when I went to protest in Lexington, um, I went two days in a row, there were like different groups that one of the protests was organized by a student, a friend of my son's who just graduated high school. And the town really showed up, mostly white and Asian American folks um, were showing up for Black Lives Matter. And so that um, was heartening to see, although I'm cautiously optimistic about that. It's, it's really about, it starts with, you know, moving your feet and marching and those sorts of protests, but it can't end there. It has to result in real change. And that requires um, undoing some of the, the structures and the ways we do business, the ways we distribute resources. And again, that's where I think the cradle to prison is so, um, concept is so important because, you know, by the time kids get to school, there's the impact of the structural inequity has already sort of dealt a major blow. And so you can't, um, I always say, you know, if I'm an educator, my expertise in education, that's the area I work on. But you can't blind yourself to the fact that you, the one area of your focus is not the be all and end all. There's a larger uh, web of issues that have to be addressed as well. So, you know, we're living through the worst president and, and someone with clear fascist tendencies. I would say they're not fascist tendencies anymore. Now we're talking about uh, employing uh, unmarked, you know, police with without clear data. In Portland, for example, you know, federal pol supposedly police or special ops units abducting people on the street, bringing them in the van, not telling, not actually arresting them, not telling them why they're being detained. Um, that's sort of a police terror operation, and it's small now, but it tells you where this president would go. So it's not just a tendency. I would say he's actually engaged in some fascist activities when he is shooting rubber bullets at peaceful protesters who are expressing their First Amendment rights for a photo op. That, that just um, is such a blatant uh, abuse of power, not to mention all the way, I mean, he was impeached for good reason and all the ways that he has um, tried to, to unjustly uh, rig the system in his favor. Um, and even his suggestion that he might not honor the elections if they don't come out the way he likes. We're, we're really dealing with um, someone, it, and it's, he has, you know, 
it's sure he hasn't engaged in genocide, but that's not how it starts, right? That's the worst outcome imaginable, but it starts with the erosion of our democratic systems. And, you know, as a critical legal scholar, I would have to say that I was never under the impression that these um, were the systems that we had in place were, you know, completely fair or, you know, perfect in any way, shape or form. So even before we had Trump, we had some very serious problems and inequities. And we are now, you know, down this path, uh, that's a very dangerous one. So, so it's, gives me, I guess that's a pretty depressing view, but what gives me signs of hope is to see, um, you know, people who I didn't think would turn out, um, show up for things like protests and demonstrations. Uh, There's a show of force that this is not an acceptable path that we're on. So we'll know more, you know, after the elections, um, but it's, it's, it's pretty scary times. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I guess out of this chaos, there is a clear sign of hope and a swing, you know, with uh, um, folks like uh, OCA in the house and, you know, people who are really speaking truth to power in positions of power. We need more of that. We need more, you know, people of color in powerful positions. And so, I, I think there's an opportunity for that to happen. It's not, it hasn't really happened yet. So I, I think there's a risk in confusing, you know, a shift and what looks like a movement to something that's an established change. We're not nearly where we need to be. And we, even when we think we're there, we won't be there. <laughs> there's always plenty more work to do, but, um, I do, it was, it was a, it did feel different, um, you know, protesting in, in Lexington, Massachusetts and seeing the streets lined with protesters who, you know, were from town. Uh, yeah, it's so, it's so true. I think everything that, that you bring up, it feels like such an oddity of this time that it feels like things have to get worse before they get better. Um, and it feels like things have gotten uh, so bad, but it's also propelled all of this change that has felt like it's taken decades for politicians to move their feet. Um, and that, I think that a lot of, feels like a lot of the activism on the ground has really propelled a lot of these movements forward. Um, and that's really exciting to see. Uh, so hopefully there's there's more of that, um, but it is, you're right, it's, it's concerning. It's no more longer just tendencies, but just outright actions that are that are concerning I and mean, it's using homeland security as sort of this yeah this terrorist police force uh, and even well before that i mean look at what ice and separating parents and changing immigration laws and that you know in some cases the his own supreme court you know because he pointed to and has the majority are conservative justices have ruled against him in a couple of cases that's how bad it is um but there are some cases where they should have ruled against him that they didn't. So it's, you know, we're far from out of the woods. And now they're talking about trying to appoint another member to the Supreme Court, you know, with Justice uh, Ginsburg's health in question. And that's a scary proposition. Because what if he wants to challenge the election and he appoints a lame duck uh, appointee? And, you know, we have, you know, George Bush Sr., I guess it was, was elected, uh, was it? Yeah, the Gore decision. That's um, Florida, yeah. yeah. That was outrageous. That was outrageous. That never should have been. We should have, Al Gore should have been the president. And he's not. And that's a huge, that was a huge change. And that changed the composition of the court and so forth. So, you know, we, I think we are, uh, we are naive if we think that fascism can't happen here because it's happened in other large countries and it's been here. I mean, think about, you know, how long it took for uh, black people to be able to vote freely, which really has never happened. It's not ever been 
total, there's always been some form of voter suppression going on, at least in some of the states. So we've never really gotten to a point where everyone is voting freely. So when we think about it that way, you know, we have a long, long way to go. And now with the Supreme Court approving some of the, uh, or, or not striking down some of the state voting suppression tactics, um, that's also something to really worry about. <laughs> yeah, I think it, it, you're right. It speaks so much, I think, to just how entrenched these systemic failures are that now it's not even just sort of subtle voter suppression. It's so blatant and the efforts are just really out there in the open. And it's because these systems are just so, yeah, it's just so hard to change these systems and they've been built this way for, for decades. Um, yeah, it's... <laughs> I think, you know, the one thing, you know, I think, um, you know, when, when they denied uh, President Obama's nominee to the Supreme Court, um, uh, what was it, Garland? Garland, yeah, I think it was Garland. Um, that was a sign of real trouble <laughs> to come. And, um, yeah, there have been, you know, for the steps forward we're making now in, in the, on the community level, we're still taking steps backwards and the next few months they're gonna, it's gonna get worse before it gets better. And so these are troubled times. It's time to make good trouble as uh, just passed away uh, Representative Lewis, um, you know, would say, and uh, you know, more, a lot more good trouble. <laughs> it's no time to sit on your hands, so. Definitely. Um, you've been so generous with your time. I just have one last question uh, for you. Uh, part of the, what we hope that this website does, the CCP website, is to make visitors reflect on their own roles, their community <laughs> in the cradle to prison pipeline. Uh, I guess my question to you is what sort of questions are important for people to ask themselves in order to properly reflect on their role and their community's role? Yeah, I think, you know, there's a lot talking, a lot of this um, discussion of sort of white privilege and that sort of thing, which is all fine and well, but I think it's more about your actions. So, um, you know, there we do live in a, a, a situation where things like racism, it's in the air that we breathe. There's an amount of implicit bias that, um, I, I don't buy that you can't, con you're totally helpless against it, but it, it, you can't control everything about your atmosphere. Um, can't control everything about the atmosphere in which you are living, but you can take actions. So it's not just who you vote for, but whether or not you attend a protest, but it's also you know, looking at your own school board and what measures are in place there that are perpetuating these problems, looking at you know, what are the healthcare policies? Or if you're, if you're not involved directly in civil rights work in your own job, what are the ways that you are um, replicating kind of systemic oppression? So it's important to reflect on yourself, especially, you know, myself as a white male in the society, but it's even more important than to act and not just to think, oh, it's not just in the language you use, or it's about the practices and the policies and changing those and changing those structures and, you know, supporting the right people in politics, but also the work that would never, whatever work you are doing to think about what actions can you take to change the, the status quo to make it more equitable.